Okay, I'm here to tell you that I am a certified weirdo. <laughs> that was supposed to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> uncomfortable. Um, it took me 33 years of my whole life to be comfortable enough to be uncomfortable, to embrace that discomfort. And I want to ask you, when was the last time you were uncomfortable? Was it this morning when you got out of bed and your cold feet touched the floor or your flo feet touched the cold floor? Or was it when we were running 45 minutes behind and you wanted to get the show on the road? Being uncomfortable is the basis for all biological systems. It's the thing that drives adaptation. It's the things that make all biological species live and thrive. We need to be uncomfortable. Um, un being uncomfortable doesn't just come from just you, your state. It comes from your environment and also from a lack of information. If you kind of break down that concept of being uncomfortable or being unfamiliar, it's because we don't really have the resources, the network, the information, the knowledge base, the social group, to be okay with our environment. And what that environment might be our mental state. It might be our social group. And when you become comfortable, which means getting all those things, that is where you are now going to drive change. And I want to share with you this guy. I said all biological species will become uncomfortable throughout their lifespan, and so will this cute little guy. He looks really uncomfortable, not because there's a threat in front of him, it's because there's this cute little unicorn outfit on top. And from a dog's perspective, it's, it's unknown. The information isn't there that this is just something cute that the owner put on for Instagram. But through repetition and comfort and emotional uh, solace from their owner, the dog will learn that this cute unicorn hat is actually something to be comfortable with with time. And I say this because how we deal with being discomfort or the unfam unfamiliarity is what separates us into two kinds of groups of people. We either could be with somebody who is someone who rejects being uncomfortable, or we can be someone who accepts being uncomfortable. Someone who rejects being uncomfortable is someone who is in a constant state of anxious, anxiety, anger, frustration, isolation, someone who runs away from that scenario. And we've all done it, I've done it, I'm, I don't want to run away right now. But I also am that person who's accepting this feeling of uncomf uncomfortableness because I have a message to share with you. I have an agenda. I want you to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. I want you to gain that confidence in any stage of your life to, and get those resources, get that network, get that knowledge foundation to be uncomfortable and deal with it. Now, whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, it doesn't really matter how you deal with it. It's the tools that you gain from your environment from your social group, from your own mental state on how you deal with it. If you're an introvert, you might deal with it through visual arts. If you're an extrovert, you might go out and drink with your friend and get it off your chest. It doesn't matter your personality types, it matters how you deal with it. Now, <laughs> the earliest memory of me being uncomfortable was when I was six years old, when my mom put this warm, annoying thing on my lap. Six years prior, I had all the love and attention, all the toys, all the uncomfortable uncom feeling from my parents. And with time, I became actually more uncomfortable because this smile is actually an illusion. If you see a picture that my parents gave me uh, many years later, <laughs> I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical because as I'm growing, I'm lacking that information on how to deal with this environment that keeps changing, this thing that keeps growing and taking my resources and my parents' love away from me. <laughs> and if you see, I, that same graph comes up where the reason why I was feeling uncomfortable is because I really didn't know how to, why my environment was changing. I'm a kid. 
I didn't understand how to get those information from my parents, from my group, my uh, environment to kind of deal with this thing that's actually something that I love dearly. And I can give you confidence that if you look at the next picture, we're actually great friends. Many, many years later, it took me a long time to learn how to be comfortable with that big uncomfortable thing, which is kind of my best friend now. So this is, this is something that I kind of want to share with you because I have been uncomfortable my whole entire life. I am tall, I am dark, I am loud, I can be annoying, I go against the grain of what people think I should be, I am of South Indian origin, I should be a medical doctor, I should be this, I should be that, that gives a lot of people this feeling of uncomfortableness or discomfort, and it gave that to me my whole life. And <clears throat> ironically enough, it uh, took me being bullied in high school for being all those things to understand everyone is uncomfortable. Especially in high school, can you imagine? All those emotions of anxiety, anger, frustration, fear, isolation, that's when it's at its prime. And that's because they don't know how to deal, we didn't know how to deal with being uncomfortable. And so I learned that really quickly, that I was really good at honing in on someone's uncomfortableness and sharing that with them so they can do better. And so in high school, you know, I fit the stereotype, I was really good at math, and I, my bully was really good at basketball. And I realized we needed each other because I wanted to get on the badminton team. Don't ask why I really like badminton. But I really wanted to get on the badminton team, and he sucked at math. We worked together, we dealt with our uncomfortableness, and we established a, um, this network at our high school where, we, where students were allowed to share the things that they were weak at and you know, gain that social uh, confidence with each other. So that was a really, really um, early lesson that I learned on targeting people's uncomfortableness to make them better, not to put them down. Because as I said, throughout your life, you are going to be uncomfortable. It's not something that's going to go away. It's something that you need to accept, and it's something that you need to deal with. So end of high school sh shows up, and I had to make one of the most difficult decisions, uncomfortable decisions of my life. Um, and if you go on to the, to the next slide, I had to decide where to go to university. I grew up in Toronto. The most comfortable decision was to go to UFT, which I got into. I wanted to be a, a, a psychiatrist, so that was going to set me up. I was going to get into med school, because everyone at, apparently at a UFT does. Um, but then at the same time, I wanted to understand the brain more. I wanted to deal with my discomfort, unfamiliarity with neuroscience, so I decide, decided to go to the city called Sudbury, somewhere in northern Ontario, and if you're from southern Ontario, Toronto, you know that north just goes to Barrie. So <laughs> Sudbury, I've never heard of, I've never seen in my life. So I thought, I'm going there. I'm going to work with that world-renowned neuropsychologist. So I did. And just like Man vs. Wild, I felt like I had to navigate how to find food, how to get on the bus, how to deal with people in residence. You know, I'm, I'm a first-generation immigrant, but I've lived in Canada my whole life. But I felt, even though I like I knew English, I didn't know how to survive. And that made me uncomfortable. And I, I want to bring this to you because we have many international students here, and I can only imagine how uncomfortable it's for them, despite knowing, not knowing the language. So I started my undergraduate in behavioral neuroscience, and boy, did that slap me across my face. I excelled in, not that yet, just yet, but I excelled in, uh, in pre-med classes, I absolutely tanked physics. I failed with a 16% on my midterm. I'll never forget it. And I, I'm, that's a really important point. Because uh, my mentor, who became my mentor, he was so weary of me, and he said, do you belong in neuroscience? There were 66 people that entered that year, year one, and I was one of the seven that graduated. One of the seven. It tells you how hard it was. <laughs> and. When, when throughout that whole undergraduate experience, there was something that really made me uncomfortable in the concept of science, which is how cells talk to each other. And that's where this picture comes in. We see when cells talk to each other, there's a molecule, binds to a receptor, boom, there's a response. 
<laughs> let's be real, it's not that simple. Because it's really like what you would see next, which is this complex network of signaling. There's all these molecules, this stresses you out, stresses me out, makes me uncomfortable to this day because this complicated language is what drives every cell in your body. It drives when it's healthy and it drives it when it's not healthy, like in the state of cancer. And it didn't make sense to me, it made me really uncomfortable. I went to all my professors and I was like, this can't be right. If we're trying to target therapeutics, how am I supposed to find that one molecule that's supposed to fix all of this? I went to that mentor who was weary of me, and I said, there has to be a way. We have to find something that we can target all of this cellular language. And he said, Narosha, you're asking the right questions, but you're not asking how. And to this day, we've come a long way in science where we have all the molecular language to target these you know, pathways and cell signaling, but I then was faced with um, another uncomfortable decision. The universe likes to throw this at me every now and then, I guess. And at the end of my undergrad, I didn't get into med school, and I had an opportunity to pursue this uncomfortableness in science or go to another graduate program which guaranteed me uh, a seat somewhere in, in medical school. And I thought, I'm going to try and deal with this uncomfortableness, and I'm going to go to that mentor and say, hey, would you take me on? And I kid you not, he said this to me, and I finally have the opportunity to say this to the world. He told me, I don't know you. He told me, I don't know anything about you. He told me that it makes me uncomfortable to give you this chance. I will never forget that words. And I said, just watch me. And he gave me that opportunity, and here I am, because he did. He made that uncomfortable decision to give someone like me a chance to explore and think critically. And that's the importance of undergraduate education. It's not only about grades, it's about skills and techniques and critical thinking for what you are going to do for the rest of your life that's going to help you deal with being uncomfortable. And so, with him, we went back to the drawing board and asked, how am I going to target this cell signaling? How am I going to challenge the current paradigm? And we turn to the thing that I failed with the 16%, physics. <laughs> Electricity, magnetism, light. That thing, those three things, could be their answer for how we control all of the cell signaling. And that's where the concept of top-down approach, Tim, if you're listening. <laughs> Yeah, right? Top-down approach. That's where that comes in, where we're trying to target information from the top down and using biophysical signaling to do that. And from that, we developed an electromagnetic therapy that can actually control cancer cells. We received over a million dollars in funding to take this to preclinical trials in MD Anderson, and I'm pleased to say there's many spin-off companies that came from this concept to target glioblastoma, not specifically from me, hold on, hold on. <laughs> not specifically from me, but we're getting there. We're getting there. But I also want to mention, it was not easy. The scientific community definitely gave us a hard time because it made them uncomfortable. It made them uncomfortable to think that, hey, this thing that we've been studying for the last 100 years, did you tell me that we can think about it another way? And I said, yeah, I did. And so from there, um, I had, again, another uncomfortable decision. I um, somehow, through, the, I guess, fate or whatever, um, I got an admission to medical school in Europe at the same time that I got a postdoctoral fellowship in Boston to explore this exact same thing in detail. And with my best friend, Dr. Rulo, married him, went to Boston, took that leap of faith, and decided to explore this with great vigor. And thank God I did, because I learned how to be uncomfortable I learned how to take that information and turn it into some therapeutics to regrow limbs, to help teach other people. I've had the opportunity to have a Harvard fellowship to teach neuroscientists or up-and-coming neuroscientists. And then when things were great, the universe hit me again with an uncomfortable decision. There was this, this city, Salt St. Marie. Salt St. Marie? <laughs> hey, I didn't hear you about Sudbury. I definitely didn't hear about Salt St. Marie. I know it's the suit now, but um, I got admission, uh, admission or a faculty post here. 
and um, everyone in Boston was like, where are you going? You're leaving this kid in the candy ground of equipment, millions of dollars, Harvard, MIT, where are you going? And I made the conscious decision to t be uncomfortable. It was very uncomfortable to come to a city that I knew nothing about, to a city and university I knew nothing about. And the answer is, 10 years ago, someone made an uncomfortable decision on me. And I want to make that opportunity for somebody else and change their lives. So from all of this storytelling, what I want to essentially you to take away from this is my job now and forever as a scientist, as a mother, and as a person of color is to equip anyone who's willing to listen, students, you, the world, to provide them the inf that information to deal with their environment, to gain that knowledge, to gain that social circle so that you can be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs>